All right, it's time to start the class. Welcome, everybody. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And um, this is the home inspection training class, number 30. Um, it's August 2nd, 2018. Uh, if you need to find us, need to contact us, need to reach us, um, I highly recommend reaching out to us. Ask, ask somebody in the marketing department or education department, what can you do for my business? And we're all on that page right there, natchi.org slash contact. We have, hmm, right now, it's probably 40 full-time people working at InterNACHI. And they all work for you. Imagine hiring 40 people to work on your business. You couldn't do it. At InterNACHI, it comes with your membership fee. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great membership benefit. And right now, we're doing a Natchi TV. If you want to uh, register for a webinar, if you want to see old webinars that are recorded, um, we have hundreds of hours of training videos online on our YouTube channels. Um, you just go to the URL, nachi.tv. That's where you'll find all this good stuff. And we were talking about Inspector Seat, finding your colleagues, your peers. We're going to inspect this house, but along the way, we can talk about anything you want. So uh, I use a home inspection, performing a home inspection. I have performed a home inspection at this point, as um, uh, um, a base, a platform upon which we can talk about other things, anything you want. Um, if you wanted to ask a question uh, and you're attending this live, bottom right corner is probably some kind of chat window or something you can type in questions. And I see we have a lot of people asking questions already. I'll try to get to them all. Um, you feel free to find me on the contact page and email me later any question as well. Um, we had over 800 students register for this live webinar um, from all over the world, and I thought it was fantastic. Um, so I want to show you. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, last night I downloaded this is the um, data dump from the students who registered for the class and we have students from American Samoa, Argentina, Botswana, Brazil, Canada, India, Papua, 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 oh I've never been there, New Guinea, sorry about that, uh, Philippines, Puerto Rico, Romania, St. Lucia, South Africa, Uganda, and the United States, just about every state in the United States. So welcome everybody from all over the world. Um, it's an honor. Again, if you're looking for InterNACHI staff members, anybody at InterNACHI need help with anything, um, natchi.org slash contact, we're all there. Um, go to natchi.org slash everything to find everything you need to be a successful home inspector. We kind of put it all there in big, easy, step-by-step -step chunks of information. NACHI TV is where you'll find all of the recorded videos of the webinars that we do and a bunch of other kinds of videos. Um, go there for your uh, next upcoming webinar. I think the next one is in October with me. We're doing another home inspection training class. Um, performing an inspection, sorry, performing a home inspection is fairly straightforward, uh, especially if you go online and, and gain the knowledge that you need to perform the tasks involved in a home inspection. But what's difficult is building and operating a business that's successful and profitable. We have the resources that you need through InterNACHI, but um, we have things like this, live webinars, where we can talk about anything you want. So um, we're here for a little bit. We're gonna perform a home inspection together, but here's some topics that may trigger some ideas or some questions you may have now or later. Um, we can talk about software and writing, um, business strategies, time management, hiring inspectors, branding, marketing, websites, how to calculate a profitable fee, handling complaints, standards and ethics, real estate agents, getting job leads, reducing your liability, legal stuff. So anything you want to talk about, we can. And if you need help that you can't find through InterNACHI, can't find it, Contact us. We'll, we'll show you where it is. But there are services out there that you may be interested in. One is Inspector Coach. 
I recommend Inspector Coach. Um, like I said before, there are no secrets to being a, a successful business owner. Um, there is a eight steps to building a home inspection business, and it's a free download from that website. So I recommend going to Inspector Coach and download the eight steps to build a successful home inspection. It's a free download. You can go through the steps yourself. But some people need a coach or a mentor to guide them through the process. There's also um, on that website some free coaching orientation webinars, and there's um, a tips to marketing to real estate agents and home buyers on that page, inspectorcoach.com. Let's do a home inspection, and let's make $1,000 today. That should be your goal. That was my goal. So I want to share how I made $1,000 a day as a home inspector. Actually, every home inspector in my company, that was the goal. If they go out, they got to come back with $1,000 gross. That's gross revenue. Some inspectors come up to me and we talk about business and they say, we grossed a half a million last year. I'm like, wow, but who cares? What does that mean? I don't, who looks at gross only, right? You can gross a million, right? And still be in the red. What's really interesting is knowing your gross revenue, but being able to calculate profit, profit margin. What is your profit margin on a home inspection that you do? Let's say you go to a home, perform only a home inspection, have you calculated how much profit you're making? If you haven't, that is a huge error. You won't make it in business if you can't figure out those two things. How much money should I make? You know, what's my desired salary this year? How much money do I have to make in order to pay my bills, my overhead, and, and my salary? Um, and what is my net profit? What's, what, what, how do I calculate that? We can calculate that. So here's what I did. If I can make $1,000 a day, I know my net profit is in there. And here's how I did it. This is my actual schedule. I leave my house at 7. It's a little early, but I'm in business. I don't have a good job. I'm not making a good living. I'm making a great living because I'm in business for myself. So I have to wake up at 6 to leave the house at 7. But I'm home around 4.35, sometimes on Friday, you know, a lot earlier than that. So it's a long day. But here's my schedule. 7 o'clock, I leave my house. I want to get to the first job early. Why? Because I never want to be late. I don't even want to be on time. Where I'm from, if you're on time, you're late. So I want to get there early so that I can set up, relax, look at the house, you know, and uh, think about what I want to do first and get ready to welcome my client who hasn't yet seen me yet, you know. So I'll make sure my breath is fresh. I've got a clean shirt. got five business cards in my shirt pocket. I'm ready to go. And I'll probably do the roof because the roof is the most difficult part, most dangerous part. I went up on the roofs because I was trained to do so. I built homes. I installed roofs all that safety stuff. You're not required, according to the standards of practice, to walk upon any roof surface, so why are you doing it? Don't risk your, the, your life. I know uh, I have a friend who fell off a ladder, not good. I know I have another one who fell off a step ladder, just slipped off a step ladder, two rungs, broke his foot. We're not really good at landing, or not, humans are not, should not be um, <laughs> lifting themselves above the earth, right? Because when we land, it's hard. So do not go up on the roof. It's not required. However, I did. I went up on the roof, got there early, inspected the roof, inspect the roof from the ground, right? It doesn't require your, your uh, client to be there. It doesn't require the homeowner to open the front door. If you can do the exterior, great. You're, you're way ahead now. So I try to get there early. I do something before my client arrives. And around 8.15, I'm inside. So I do the roof and the exterior, and I'm, now I'm inside, right? And I want to do the major big systems to get them out of the way. I always just did the hard stuff first. Some inspectors do the kitchen first. That's like the easiest stuff. It's really where I want to end. It feels more comfortable. It feels 
uh, like everyone wants to talk in the kitchen so I can do a summary of the inspection in the kitchen. So I want to end there. I don't want to start there. I'll set up there, but I want to end there. So my beginning point is to start early, get up on the roof, do the exterior, and then I'm doing the HVAC system, hot water source, water supply coming in, drain going out, and the plumbing, right? Um, and then we'll do electrical and panel and, and the structure next. But I want to do those major – if I'm doing an inspection on a Saturday, and maybe there's an uncle – who's an HVAC technician or something, I want to come, I want to go down to that HVAC system and I want to do the hard stuff first, right? To get it out of the way and to show that, um, well, my goal was to educate my client on how the home works and how to maintain it. Ideally, how to save energy, a little bit of that stuff. But I also want to um, set my client's, um, I want to satisfy my client's expectations. Like, did we actually hire the right inspector? And if I can show them the difficult stuff first and get that out of the way, they'll be like more confident. That's why I always felt like I want to do the hard stuff first. It's totally up to you, whatever you want to do, right? The fun stuff is in the big systems like HVAC. At 10 o'clock, I'm in the attic and that's now two hours, right? I start my first inspection at eight o'clock a second one's at 12. I did two a day. That gives me four hours in between. Home inspection takes me about three hours. Complete, completely done from 8 to 11. So when I'm in the attic at 10, I feel like oh, I'm almost done, really. I feel like I'm done with the inspection because it's what? Attic, garage, interior, bathrooms, kitchen. And that is like nothing. That's less than an hour for sure, right? I'm talking about time management. I'm talking about being efficient with your time. Why? Why is that important? Why am I not spending, why am I, oh, who cares how long it takes, right? Because in this business, I want to, in a lot of businesses, I want to make sure I'm paying attention to this math formula where you put all your money on the top and you divide it by your time. Your gross is on your top, divided by the, the numerator, divided by denominator. Numerator is your money divided by denominator, your time. If you're spending a lot of time making money, that's not <laughs> that's a waste of time, right? You're not going to have a whole lot of profit, right? What you want to do is shrink your denominator, shrink your time by being efficient with your time. First, you have to manage your time and then be efficient with it. And I don't mean running, literally running through the house and blowing off responsibilities of providing a comprehensive inspection. I mean, considering writing your report using a mobile device. That's how you can shrink the denominator. That's how you can save time. You wanna make that bottom part of your fraction really small so that it only takes you a little bit of time to make a lot of money, right? And then we'll talk about how you make a, the, the top part of the fraction really big. It's probably by providing value, if you can provide, if you can overwhelm your clients with incredible value, you can demand higher prices. That means you can make more money. And if you're efficient with your time, if you're managing your time well, um, then the there's um, that ratio is really good for you to make a lot of profit, a lot of money, and come home before five o'clock, right? Uh, so at 10 o'clock, I'm two hours in, essentially. My client thinks I'm about two hours in. I could have been there earlier. And around uh, 10.30, I'm in the kitchen, and I'm thinking about printing stuff off and going through a summary and um, finalizing the report, maybe playing some videos of some defects that I found. That was always interesting for my clients. I filmed defects, and then I played those videos for my clients at the end of the inspection. And this is what I gave every one of my clients. Nice three ring binder with a lot of stuff in it. So if I'm gonna charge $396, that was our base price. If we had a base price of $396 and then we added more money according to um, uh, size, we had to charge a little bit more for size, distance, and age. The older they are, the more fun they are, but it takes more time. Remember, if I'm going to increase my time, 
I better increase my fee, right? So that the ratio is the same. So I'm making the same amount of profit um, per uh, minute, actually. Um, so you open up my three ring binder and you get the inspection report. This is an actual printed inspection report that I did. Um, there's some pictures. Let's see if I can get a camera. Pictures, report. There's the exterior. And they can go through. So I would print it black and white. Um, at the inspection, it was pretty crazy. Um, nowadays, you can, you know, you can send a link to the report in the cloud. But my clients wanted to feel something, to have something in their hands, um, and my agents like that as well. I worked with real estate agents, um, so you know, one of the tips of marketing to real estate agents is simply ask them, "What do you? Th can you tell me what a a good home inspection is for you? What's the experience like?" You know, and then just provide that service. Um, have you talked to any real estate agents? Have you talked to them? What makes a really good home inspection for you? What is a really good home inspection report? What does it look like? And then just provide that service. If that's what they need, then provide that. Um, the binder held the home maintenance book. And then there was things like the, I didn't have it back then, but I wish I did, the buyback guarantee. Um, homeowner newsletter um, and some ancillary uh, services. Ancillary services are additional home inspection services that you do that doesn't increase necessarily the time that you do them in. So if I'm at a home inspection, that's really the worst case scenario. I'm only doing a home inspection. That's terrible. What I'd like to do is a home inspection because that's 400 bucks and then add an ancillary inspection or two on top of it. Um, when I was in business, 75% of all of our home inspections scheduled included a radon test for $130. Wow. It, it took several minutes to do. Um, and 50% of them had a, um, a $75 um, wood-destroying organism inspection. So I look for anything that eats wood. So when I came out of there, I was punching 600 gross. Um, and that would be a really nice, really nice inspection. But in here, if you were unable to sell ancillary services, additional inspections, you can have these handy. Let's say you're down in the basement and you're only doing a home inspection. So you want to kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to say be a salesman. Let's say you want to provide uh, an opportunity for your client to learn more. Um, you could read off of this and then give them a rack card. So InterNACHI designs these customized, these are rack cards because they can go in a rack. Um, but you can use them to sell ancillary services. You know, you cannot see, smell, or taste radon, but it may be in a problem. It may be a problem in your home. Let me test your home for radon. Here, why don't you read this while I'm inspecting the electrical panel? If you want me to do a radon test, I got the test kits outside, and uh, we could schedule that up for you. Oh, did you know that mold damages everything it grows on? Mold damages what it grows on, and the longer it grows, the more damage it can cause. Let me inspect your home for mold. So that's a little like you can help yourself in selling ancillary services by using InterNACHI's member marketing team uh, stuff that they've created for you. And you can remind yourself by sticking it in the pocket of your three ring binder. And your business card is there. And there's also at the end of the summary, which comes at 11 o'clock, right? Um, I leave a letter for the homeowner. It says, um, you know, a home inspection can be a stressful process for a seller. During the inspection, we make every, every effort to respect your home and leave it as we found it. Yada, yada, yada. We looked over 500 different things. We tried to put things back. Here's a list of some of the things you may want to check after I leave that um, you want to put back where you had them. Um, and, you know, if we fail to do anything that we should have done, please feel free to call us or contact us. And just so you know, all of our inspectors wore indoor only shoes. And our inspectors were required to take a picture of their indoor only shoes, right? So you have a roof shoe. I just use sneakers. You have an exterior boot. 
especially if you're doing new construction, you don't want a nail coming through your foot or something landing on it, or um, you gotta handle mud, or sometimes it's high grass in a wet area. It all depends on where you're doing inspection. And then indoor only shoes. Um, some inspectors wear those booty things. I really, like a hospital nurse, I really wasn't into that. Um, just wearing indoor only shoes. And I carried all that stuff to the front door using uh, oh, 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 a home inspection tool bag. This, um, this is a new tool bag, but this is exactly, they still make it. It's exactly a big, open mouth, long canvas tool bag with exterior pouches and interior pouches. Um, this one is branded Internachi. I like it. And you can get it at inspectoroutlet.com. Inspectoroutlet.com. This is fantastic. It holds everything I need. And it closes up, too, if you needed to close it up. And I just drop it at the front door. Uh, that seller letter. Remember the letter to the seller? This is a new product. I wish I had this. This is from Internachi's member marketing team. This is a product that you can buy for your company. It's a lunchbox. And it says, we really appreciate you. Thank you for allowing us to inspect your home. Look inside for a gift. And you leave this on the kitchen table for the occupants or seller or listing agent, hopefully, to look inside and, oh, there's a gift. What is it? I don't know. That's up to you. We did candy. Um, here's a little thing about um, the newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter. We have a newsletter system. It actually is a, a free online newsletter system for your clients. Because you got to keep in contact with your clients. Okay, there's a lot of things I can play around with all these tools and stuff. But I wanted to show you that's my first inspection. I'm out of here at 11:01 with hopefully about 500 bucks in my pocket. And we used credit cards, right? You can use Square. There's all those things you put on your device. If um, if you don't have um, if you don't have a thing for accepting credit cards. Um, what you want to do is Nachi. Oh, there we go. Nachi.org merchants to get a um, a credit card swiper. I don't know what they call them. So you can set, accept credit cards. Man, when we started accepting credit cards and no checks, ugh, it was so much easier for our clients to pay us. Um, so that was kind of cool. That is my, oh, and then I have an hour for my lunch. I bring my lunch. I bring an extra shirt. I change my shirt. It's white shirts for the summertime, blue shirts for the wintertime, long sleeve, uh, tucked in, um, no shorts. Um, I was in the Northeast cold climate. So in the South where it's hot and humid, uh, for sure. But uh, dress appropriately, business casual. Um, and then at 12 o'clock, I'm doing my second job. I go back to the office if I need to, maybe with some radon uh, kits to drop off or some paperwork or some money um, that didn't get charged through a credit card. And then I'm home at 4.30 and I'm playing with the kids. And I, I feel really good because I just did a home inspection for a thousand bucks. I mean, I did a, a full day's work for a thousand dollars. I'm looking at the questions. Any questions? Lots of questions. Hey, Mark, you live in Philly. That's cool. Uh, I lived in Pottstown, which is out on the suburbs of Philly. And um, Philadelphia is a tough market. There's probably 200 inspectors within a 20-mile radius. So how are you successful? How are you going to grow your business? How are you going to make more money in your business when you have that much competition? You have to stand. How are you going to stand out from among 200 Choices. Imagine if you had 200 pizza places in your neighborhood. How are you, which one do you choose? You know? So a tip would be, um, so I learned about this, distinguishing yourself and providing incredible value in my market where you really had to compete. And to be number one, you got to be the best in everything. So imagine a line of inspectors, and we're all certified, and we're all licensed. We're all standing in a row, right? And the idea is to step, take a step forward when you are different from the rest, right? So, like, one of the worst things 
to deal with is a license state. Because when you attain a license, you become a commodity. In fact, you could argue that all home inspectors, no matter where you are, are providing your commodity. You should look that up. That's homework for today. You're doing homework today, right? 30 to 60 minutes today. Don't watch TV. Don't play a video game. Do homework on your business. Look up the word commodity. You do not want to live in the world of commodity. You do not want to be a commodity, which is basically one home inspector is interchangeable with any other home inspector. We all perform a home inspection according to a standard of practice. Well, that means we're all doing the same thing. So what distinguishes you from the rest? We all have a license. We all have a certification. We're all standing in the same line. What? How are you going to stand out from the crowd? Do you provide infrared scans? Do you include infrared scans at no additional cost on every home inspection? Yeah, I do. Take a step forward, maybe. Ah, that was a big jump. Only a third went forward. Don't freak out about infrared. We'll talk about infrared. Do you provide a home maintenance book? Do you print out the report and provide a home maintenance book to every one of your clients in the three-year environment? Yeah. Do you, how about a, a newsletter for every client? Yep. How about a buyback guarantee? Absolutely. Why wouldn't I do that? It's fantastic. Do you get there early? Yep. Do you go up on a roof? Yep. Do, by the time I'm done answering questions, I'm the only one. I'm standing out in an empty field. There's no one around me. It's so easy to see why I'm the best and the only one to choose in a market with 200 inspectors surrounding me. I'm the only one that everyone sees. Why? Because I am able to distinguish myself from all the rest. That's what you need to do. Do not do this. Be a commodity and stand in line with everybody else and complain that the phone's not ringing. That is a serious issue. When your phone's not ringing, then you got to think of something, right? And so you need inspector coach. You need to go to slash everything. You need to call the marketing department and talk to Jessica. You need to do something, right? You need to go through the exercises that we have in Chapter 11 of our Home Inspection Business Course, a free online business course. Have you taken it? You should. You have to. It's critical. Go to Chapter 11. You have to go through the exercise of figuring out what your brand is. Why are you different from all the rest? What is the incredible amount of value? If, the, if your client is overwhelmed with value, you can demand a higher price, too, so you make more money. Your numerator's big. Holy cow, I ha we haven't even started the home inspection. We've been talking about business and marketing, right? See how I do this? I, I apologize. I just talk and talk and talk. Um, David asks, do some states require passing a national test and others do not? Absolutely. Unfortunately, most states were suckered into recognizing only one exam. Um, and um, that's not good, right? A monopoly on the exam, it's not fair. States should recognize other national exams or international ones. Internet cheese is online, and if your state requires it to be proctored, we have a proctoring system. Um, is there a good insurance company you know of to buy professional home insurance? Yeah, I know the best insurance deal for you if you're an international member. If you're not an international member, uh, I don't know what you do. Natchi.org, Natchi.org, sorry, slash insurance. Go there and get a quote real quick. Um, I know I just met the folks who run that relationship, partnership that we have. Internachi members are recognized by this insurance group. It's a fantastic deal. You can get general liability, protect your tools in your truck, um, protect yourself, um, protect yourself from damaging. You know, I, I, um, I damaged something valuable in a home once. No big deal. I had insurance. There's E&O insurance, too. It kind of relieves you of this burden, too. Ah, like, you know, I'm, I'm protected. I can protect my house. I don't have to worry about it going very far. And this group here has a layer of defense in between you making a claim for your client or with your client, right? So 
take a look at Natchez.org slash insurance. Um, also, Natchez.org slash buy. That's the buyback program. If an InterNACHI member has actually missed something in a home inspection, according to the standards of practice, that's within the standards of practice, and you missed it, right? You missed this big structural thing. Structure is part of the standards of practice. Um, mold, for example, is not covered by this. Um, InterNACHI will buy the home back. And that's a fantastic deal there. So those are two things I would use in conjunction with each other and at the same time, right? The insurance and the guarantee. Let's do a home inspection on this house. Can we? So again, I'm there early and I'm gonna inspect the roof. Do not go up on the roof, you're not required to be on the roof. I did it, why? Because that distinguished me from all the rest. Remember lining up? Who goes up on the roof? Who carries tall ladders on a ladder rack on a huge, uh, huge van? Inspection vehicle. That's me. I was big, big, large, and I got up on the roof. Even got up on barns. I, I carried a 40 foot aluminum ladder like a nut, right? That was part of my brand. And it kind of helped me be a home inspector too because, man, when I got up on the roof, I saw things. When I got up to the gutter, I, I could see things. And what do you see here? Two layers of shingles. And so I identified the layers of shingles. Okay, when you have two layers of shingles, um, code, the International Residential Code, talks about installing a second layer, a re-roof, a layer on top of an old layer. There are some conditions to do that. You better know your township requirements as well. Um, do they require something special if you do a, a re-roof? Maybe they don't like re-roofs, right? You can't have things blowing, like in, in uh, a high wind area in Florida, you can't just keep throwing layers on, right? All that stuff has to be fastened down well. That's the concern when you do two layers. The fastening has to go through the deck sheathing, right? It has to poke through, right? And oftentimes, on the second layer, you're, you're short. So when there's a second layer, guess what I'm doing? I'm tugging. I'm not pulling. I'm not yanking. I'm not trying to damage something. I'm just tugging the shingles to see if they lift off. Sometimes they do. Sometimes the second layer of shingles will actually lift off in my hand, and I know I've got a problem. I stick my hand underneath the layers, and I take a picture of it. Okay. Also, the flashing. So there's fastening and flashing when there's a second layer, F and F. Flashing, fastening. Flashing um, should be redone with the top layer of shingles. The top roof covering material should be flashed properly. So around the chimney stack. The step flashing should be pulled out of the lower, older, first layer and installed with the newer layer shingles. Otherwise, you're going to get this big goop of roofing cement, right? And that's not going to work because that's temporary. That's like a band-aid. Metal flashing should be installed with the second layer of roof. That's how I inspect it. Those were my recommendations. So. I get up on the roof, I take a picture of every everything, every plane, every surface, the ridge, the front, the back, the shingles themselves, and there's my money shot. So this picture is just me taking a picture of my feet. Why would I do that? This is part of my brand. And where is this picture of my brand going? It is going in the most important piece of marketing that I create every day. And that's the home inspection report. The home inspection report is your most important piece of marketing. Why? Because if someone is reading through your inspection report, by the time they get through it, by even halfway through it, they should be thoroughly convinced that you're the best home inspector in the world. Your report should just overwhelm them with, wow, that's a lot of great information. This person really knows what to expect. She found all these defects. He is all over the place in this report, right? Look at all the pictures. This is incredible. So that's why you should work on your report every day. Always try to improve the way you write an inspection report. 
because International's member marketing team can produce marketing materials and ideas like this coloring book for kids on a Saturday, right? But we can't help you with your report. Only you are in charge of your inspection report, and it's the most important thing in your marketing strategy. So here's what I did. I, if I'm going to distinguish myself from all my competition by doing this, walking on the roof, I'm going to tell everybody. I'm not going to keep it a secret. You know, I've heard that uh, you know, there are a lot of inspectors handing out the home maintenance book. So this is Internachi's home maintenance book. And it's fully customizable, too. We have a Florida one, because Florida is like a, its own country. Um, we have a Spanish version. And it's fully customizable at the same price. So this is a customized home maintenance book, full color, inside and out. So customize a home maintenance book, right, and give it to your clients. But I've heard that a lot of inspectors don't even market that they give a home maintenance book. They don't even tell anybody. They just hand it over at the very end, like icing on the cake. What does that do? This has to be an upfront value proposition. You have to tell people that this is one of the reasons that you should be hired. You provide a home maintenance book to convey all this great information, how a home works, how to maintain it, how to save energy, all this stuff that you don't have to say during an inspection, right? how to change the air filter. You give this to your client on every home inspection. So this should be part of your brand and part of your marketing strategy. You should tell this. It's, it's got to be way up front. You have to tell people what you do. Don't save it for the last thing. Don't save it like icing on the cake. Don't save it. Don't hide it until the, the last moment at the kitchen table. Tell people what services you provide. If you do infrared, if you use a moisture meter, say you use a moisture meter, right? Put that in your report. So that people who are reading your inspection report see that, oh, they use special tools. So that picture is in my inspection report for sure. So is this one. I get up close and personal with everything that I inspect. I love that shot. That's cool. You just see me on the roof doing all these crazy shots, right? <laughs> it's not just pictures of um, shingles like this. I know what that is, you know what that is, but my client doesn't know what that is, really, because there's no scale. What is it? So that's why my hand is in the picture of many, many, many shots I have my hand in it, right? Okay, so I take pictures of the roof. I'm looking at the top surface. It looks in pretty good condition. I don't see anything wrong, really. The flashing around all the vent pipes were redone. Yay. Sometimes they're not. Here's a chimney. Just taking a look, taking a look at the questions. Looks like I got a warning. Looks like my audio is good. Okay, so here's um, a chimney stack. Here's um, the chimney stack, metal chimney stack, uh, double triple line from the fireplace and the heating system. I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to reserve my description of this until I know what's going on inside. I think it's a fireplace. So I'm going to look, look, ah, uh, yeah, right? Um, it's probably some soot from a fireplace. So I'm going to take a look inside. But I don't know. Like, I'm going to just reserve. You, you're allowed to, right? A lot of inspectors get in trouble by saying, oh, yeah, this is from the gas hot, uh, hot water tank. You know, you have no idea what's going on. Is, the, is this the heating system? Is the heating system? Maybe it's an oil fired heat. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. It's okay. You don't have to know everything while you're inspecting because that's where you get in trouble, right? I mean, if you looked at something and you don't know what it is, you know what the best thing to do is? You know what the best thing to say, tell your client, the best thing to say out loud if you're asked? I don't know what that is. Or, I don't know, but you know what? If you give me till tonight, right, I'll research it and I'll find out what that thing is. And we'll get an answer. I'll get an answer for you for sure. I'm not going to let this hang. I'm going to find out what this is. One, it benefits your client, obviously. But two, most importantly, it benefits you. You get to learn something new. So if you don't know what's going on, it's okay. Just say, I don't know what this is. Maybe you'll find out later.
what it is. Uh, there's the rear yard, really nice. Gutter shot, that's a gutter shot. It's filled with stuff. That's okay, it's not clogged. No big deal. Soft vent, ridge vent. Now I'm coming down my ladder. I'm getting to the ground, and I'm thinking exterior. I'm gonna do the exterior next. But at this moment, when I step down on the ground, and I'll finish up with a couple things, I'm using a mobile device, and I have inspected an entire system, the roof system. I've taken pictures, video, and I've written the inspection report of that section. So I'm done. When I step off my ladder and I'm on the ground doing the exterior, getting ready to do the exterior, or maybe welcoming my client because they're in the driveway by now. Remember, the roof is first, exterior for me, exterior second. I'm done with the inspection of the roof. And I'm done writing about it as well. Maybe I could, if I'm good at this, sometimes I'm not good with technology. Technology is great when it all works, right? So, let me get this over here. So this is my phone. Oh, that's my wife, sorry. Okay. Um, Spectora is a software I have on my phone. Um, oh, darn it. So I have um, Home Inspector Pro, I have Home Gauge, I have Spectora, I also have Pitch Factor. So this is an app, it's kind of cool. Um, uh, okay, um, so it, it allows me to measure, um, there's my web camera, let's see what degree it's on. So it's basically level, but let's say it's off a little bit, right? What kind of pitch is the roof? Well, it's a 412. And I can take a picture of it and I can produce it, put it in the report as well. So it's, there's a pitch factor here. And it's pitch factor is the app, at least for my iPhone. Okay, go back. Spectora. So here's, Spectora is a really good software that I like. Um, my fingers are fat and they've got big buttons. So um, that's why I like it. So here's the report. I'm taking a picture of the house. I'm gonna use that photo in the report. Uh, my client is there. And my agent is there. And inspection details, okay. So can you see that? Is it on the screen? Yeah, I think it is. So my client. Um, if you wanna take a picture of your client, right? Let's take a picture of the client. There's a fellow. It's a fella. Um, it's furnished. Uh, is it really furnished? Yeah, it is furnished. Here's, um, here's the furnishings. Right? I'll use that photo. And uh, there's the furnishings here. I'll use that photo. And the furnishings there. I'll use that photo. Um, it's uh, detached. Uh, it's clear. Um, let's see. That's done. Mm, go back. I'll do the roof. The roof covering materials. Um, I inspected it from the ground and the roof and uh, take a picture of the roof. There's my feet. And, um, take a picture of uh, the flashing detail. And there's that. And um, a little video. Sometimes my the connection between my phone and my desktop fails. I'm gonna do pictures and video, let's see what happens. Ah, I knew it. So I did it again. Let me move over. Oop. So let me connect these two again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I took a picture of the roof and a video of the roof and let's see, um, unable to walk upon the roof surface um, because I take a picture because there was snow or something and then um, recommendations here I see some cracked roof covering. Um, also, um, missing the roof covering, and let's take some photos of that. 
So here's a, here's a bad roof picture there and um, I can draw a little arrow if I wanted to. There's little arrows, I hate arrows personally. Um, and then uh, there's another one where it's bad. So the thumbs down means that's not a good thing. Um, again, I can do uh, little arrows if I wanted to. And then improper flashing, I can flag that um, or just take a picture of it. Improper flashing. Okay, so a couple minutes, and I'm taking pictures and I'm writing comments as I inspect. And when I'm on the ground, I'm done with the roof inspection, done with taking pictures, done with taking videos, and done with writing the report. Because I want that denominator of that fraction really small, right? Uh, let's save it to the cloud. So I'm uploading this report to my account. Boy, I hope I do this. I hope the Spectora guys are not paying attention because I'm not very good at this technology stuff. Um, but I'm actually a very, very good candidate for this. So I'm going to um, take a look at my reports. Um, where are my inspections? Um, oh, it's a weaning dashboard. And now I have a report to read. Where are my reports? I wish I knew. <laughs> Let's see. Oh. There it is. So remember I took a picture of that area there? That's the window in my inspection office. There's the map of the place that I'm inspecting. Um, and this is the actual report itself. Um, and there's the agreement and there's the inspector, right? And um, oh, I'm not very good at this. View the report. Reports, publish all. You? No. Click the wrong information. You? <laughs> Thanks for your patience. So this is the full report. It looks like a website, actually. There's a picture of my client. Do you remember me taking a picture of that? Um, there's uh, occupancy. Remember, I took three pictures. It was occupied house. Um, there's the roof section. Um, the roof is covered with shingles, and we've got even a video. And there's a, an illustration. And here's some problems. We have cracked roofing materials. We've got some pictures of the of the cracked shingles. Um, in another illustration, if you wanted to put an illustration in there. Um, and then I haven't done the rest, but I was doing um, the attic section prior in this in the morning, trying to do a good job for you guys. But here's the summary of the report. Um, this is an actual report. You can download this as a PDF too. It's right here, download the PDF. So why I like this is it looks like a website. It's dynamic, it moves around. You can watch videos. The summary is kind of cool. Um, the full report actually shows how many items that you inspect, right? And how many recommendations that you've made. And it's, um, it's, it's a really nice way to read the report. Here's the limitations. I, I attempted to walk on the roof, but I couldn't do it. Do you remember that? Here's the standards of practice. And there's the report itself. It's really nice. It's a really nice software. So forget about the actual software itself. Spectora is really cool. What's, what the point is that I'm able to manage my time and make more money by providing incredible value. My client gets this incredible report that beats all other reports. And um, I'm more efficient with my time because I'm using a mobile device. 
and I reduce my liability for so many, so many reasons. I reduce my liability because I'm writing, I'm inspecting with essentially a checklist of what to inspect. It's a standards of practice and a couple other notes that I have. And if I forget to um, inspect the flashing around the chimney, well, I'm holding that checklist. It will tell me I have to inspect the chimney flashing. I won't make a mistake. A lot of people are on their own, essentially, trying to remember what to inspect for two and a half, three hours. That's tough. And then at the end of the day, in the evening, after dinner, they write the report. Can you remember what you did at 8 o'clock in the morning? No. Nah. So going mobile helps you manage your time, makes your denominator small, it makes you make more money, allows you to make more money, allows you to realize more profit. It's very easy to make your time more efficient when you go mobile. Yeah? By the time I get down to on the ground, I'm done with that system, and I'm thinking about other systems. Let's talk about how to create, um, how to write about defects. What kind of defects are there? Well, there's a lot of, lot of questions. Emmanuel asks, what other services would you recommend a new business just getting started? Um, it sometimes uh, depends upon your climate or the, the type of homes that you have. So um, for me, Northeastern, cold climate, um, there was rain on. Uh, I'm now in Colorado. One out of every two homes has radon. So all home inspectors are doing radon. Well, not, not all home inspectors. Some. Uh, for me, a cold climate, I was able to use infrared. Um, here's my infrared camera. And what I did was, because um, things are cold, and the summers are really hot and humid. Um, so this is my infrared camera. There we go. And this is a FLIR C2 camera. It's about 400 and something dollars through Inspector Outlet. Uh, you uh, select that you're an InterNACHI member. You type in your InterNACHI member to get a discount, a special price, um, just like everything else. InterNACHI membership benefits you in many ways. Um, and I included this with every home inspection. By, by doing that, I provided an incredible amount of value. So this was an extra service, but I didn't sell it as an extra service. I used this as adding value to my core service, home inspection, to make my home inspection service really valuable so that I can increase the price. So my first camera that I bought was $5,000. I put it on a credit card and I increased my fees to allow my clients to pay me to use my infrared camera. So it went from 329 to 369 because we included infrared with every home inspection, right? And infrared, don't freak out about infrared. Infrared is kind of like um, a flashlight. It allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. That's what a flashlight does. Here's a high lumens LED flashlight. This allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. If something's dark in the corner there, well, without it, I can't see. But with it, this allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. And the word flashlight doesn't even appear in standards of practice. You could argue that using a flashlight is going beyond the standards of practice. Infrared is the same thing. It allows me to see things I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. So on this table, what do you see? Hmm. Well, how about now? What do you see? So before the webinar started, I got a cup and I filled it with hot water, and a cup filled with cold water. For the infrared, with the infrared, um, cold things like groundwater at, at groundwater temperature um, are dark blue. And hot things are orange or white hot if it's really hot, right? Not necessarily all the time, right? The, the cold thing back there, the cold cup of water, it could be something else. It could just be something cold. It doesn't necessarily have to be wet. That's why 
you follow up with your infrared companion, your moisture meter. This is a, a probe or a, a non-invasive surface moisture meter to follow up your infrared scans. There's also a third cup. It's right here, right? And there's also next to it a bottle of water at room temperature. So that bottle there is filled with water. So using infrared won't show you water just because it's there. It only shows you surface temperature of the things that are there, right? So you may miss an entire gallon of water using your infrared because you haven't figured out how to manipulate the environment. If you can somehow manipulate the environment, right? And you know how uh, some principles of building science work, right? Then you can see things with this, right? So as the water was sprayed, it evaporated and cooled off and it landed on the floor. And now from 10 feet away, I can see that we have a, a cold spot and with my moisture meter, I can confirm that it's water. If you can change the temperature of your environment, things like this water bottle jump out at you because you've changed the temperature of the environment. Now that's, now that's warm. It's really cold. So to answer your question, you don't have to have ancillary services necessarily to make profit. What you can do is add things that add value, incredible amount of value. If you can add incredible amount of value to your home inspection service, you can demand higher fees. And by doing this with infrared, I was able to demand a higher fee because this didn't add any additional time. It didn't add any additional overhead because I simply increased the fee of my inspection and allowed my clients the benefit of having me provide infrared, free infrared with every home inspection. That's how I got away with it. So there's two ways to do that, right? There's ancillary services that are truly separate, like a mold inspection. You can make the same amount of money as a home inspection doing a mold uh, inspection with sampling. Or you could do things like this that add value to your current service so you can increase your fees. To um, communicate well to your client about the observations that you see during an inspection, um, you, have to, you have to use uh, the word defect. <laughs> Material defect is actually written in the standards of practice. If you find a defect and you see it during your inspection and you deem it to be really serious, a material defect, you have to put it in the inspection report. All other defects, you're not required to find them. You're not required to find every defect in a home. There could be a defect underneath this table. If I don't observe it, it's beyond my visual scope. If I don't observe a defect, right, that's not part of the report. If I see a defect and it's not really, it's a cosmetic defect, it's not required to be in the report. If there's a defect behind this wall, I can't see it. I'm not required to put it in the report. There's only one defect that's written in the standards of practice and it's a material defect. And that's the one that could hurt somebody or have an adverse impact on the value of the home. And if you see that defect, you deem it to be material, you have to put it in the report. All other defects, well, I chose to use these definitions to help me convey to my client the degree of severity of the different types of defects that I found. Because a lot of my clients were first-time home buyers and they have no idea what's going on. They think a stain on the carpet is as important as a crack in the chimney, right? They don't know. So some things are cosmetic, some things are minor, like a, a dirty air filter, which can be fixed by a homeowner. That's a minor defect. A major defect is a hole in the roof, it has to be fixed by a, a professional, and a material defect, well, that's gonna hurt somebody. So 
those definitions are in our, our glossary, the InterNACHI online glossary of definitions. You can use them. Feel free to use them or use something else. So at 8 a.m., I'm done with the roof inspection. I'm also done with writing the inspection report. And the recommendation is to write your inspection report as you inspect in order to be efficient with your time. So we're going through the house and we're taking pictures of everything. There's the deck flashing. You've got to have ledger flashing. And there it is up close. And it's installed. It looks pretty good. The railings, I kind of wiggle it. You know, it's supposed to hold 200 pounds in any direction. I'm a big guy. I don't want to have a party out there and fall off the deck through the railing because it's weak. And there's me stepping on the deck, you know, on some decks. Well, on all decks. I, I kind of do the wiggle, you know, stand on the deck and then grab the railing. If it wiggles, that's a, that's a defect. That's a major structural problem. Right? It shouldn't move, really. There should be a graspable handrail for the stairs. This handrail is not graspable. I'll put it in the report as a safety issue. I don't want anybody falling down. you got to grab onto a, a handrail. It has to be graspable or graspable, gra graspable. I don't even know if that's a word. I think it's in code, though. And I take a look at the understructure. I want the, the floorboards of the deck to be securely fastened to the ledger board. And I want that ledger board to be lag screwed or bolted or fastened in some approved way. And I like to see that flashing. That's nice. If you go to natchi.org slash gallery, natchi.org slash gallery, we have a huge library of um, a gallery of inspection images and illustrations that you can add to your inspection report. So if you go here, um, that's what it looks like. Whoop. So there's the ledger flashing, and you can use illustrations to help you communicate to your client what you're talking about. Right? And so there's the, there's the flashing there, the detail. And all of these illustrations, we have thousands of them in our gallery, they're free and online to our members to help you, remember what I said before, improve your best marketing piece, which is your inspection report. Always be working on your best marketing piece. That's your inspection report. Um, if you wanted to learn about how to inspect uh, decks, or you wanted to gain more knowledge in that, you can go to our education page, which is natchiorg slash education. Um, you go into the search field. It says search courses. And you type in decks. Type in deck. And we have how to perform deck inspections course and how to perform deck inspections video course, which is the one I like. And it's um, a video um, of how to inspect the deck. So that's um, a way that Internet Chief members are the best inspectors in the world because you have access to all the information that you need to gain knowledge and how to perform an inspection, all the tasks involved in performing an inspection. So continuing with the exterior, I got some comments about the deck and I come across the exterior compressor unit the air conditioner unit, and I take a picture of the manufacturing label. I could use it to determine a few things like the size um, and the age. Um, there's a, a website that I recommend. Um, you can check it out. It has nothing to do with InterNACHI. I just found it by accident. It's building-center.org. Um, building and there, if you go there, let's see if it's available. Yep. Yeah. Um, you can get the HVAC age by, um, let's see if it's, um, well, let's just pick something. Um, pick a manufacturing uh, name, and they'll tell you how to find the, the age of the unit and the size sometimes, just by the manufacturing label. So you can use that website. It's a really great website. I don't know who runs it, but... Um, it's a really nice resource to find information based upon the manufacturing label that you take a picture of. Um, this one's Lennox. There's the disconnect. There's the refrigerant lines. Large one is the suction line. It's insulated. Thin one, thin diameter is the liquid line. And I think it was replaced. 
Um, this is a, a newer unit. The older unit um, was replaced. Um, the base is not secure because uh, they put the base on top of a piece of rotten wood, so that needs to be fixed. And this um, disconnected copper pipe is from the old refrigerant line, old liquid line. There's the dryer exhaust. All water faucets need to be frost proof uh, in a northern climate. And there's the exterior. And I take a look at anything of different materials where two different materials meet, maybe where the window meets the brick exterior or where the door or the landing meets the, the brick exterior, where the asphalt meets the, the tread of the concrete of the garage. So everything's looking good. Oh, there's my old bag. Um, water faucet in the front, front door. So when I inspect a door or a window on the exterior, it's typically the same process. I go counterclockwise. Um, it's bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left. I go around like that. I take a look at the windows in that way. I take a look at the doors in that way. I take a look at the flashing areas in that way. The, I'm looking for wood rod up here and flashing up there. Um, same thing with rooms. I go counterclockwise. So I open up a bedroom and I'll go to the right and I'll go all the way around. If I'm on the exterior and I have a detached house, I do the same thing. I go to the right and I go around, you know. I may take my client around real quick in the beginning and then let them go inside and do what they want to do, which is like take measurements and think about renovating and putting granite countertops in it. And then I'll go myself and I'll take about 10, 15 minutes on the exterior. The exterior is very easy. The roof is maybe 15 minutes. The exterior is another 15 minutes. I'm trying to get member to the HVAC system. So here, bottom left, bottom right, top right, well, there's brick exterior, and there's a, um, there's a, a big piece of metal holding up the brick above the door, essentially, right? And where that metal is, um, where that beam is, yep, where the web comes out, um, some mortar work <coughs> was replaced. There's a driveway. Crack in the driveway, no big deal. There's the house. When I'm doing the exterior inspection, I'm bumping into other systems like the electrical system. So there's the electrical meter, phone, grounding wire, grounding rod. Downspout should be diverting water further away from the house and it actually is loose. So I'll put that in the report. That's a minor defect. A15, I'm done with the exterior. Now I'm going to the big stuff, the fun stuff, the HVAC system, hot water source, water supply, water drain. It starts with the thermostat. There's the air filter. I put that in the report so my client knows where the air filter is. The unit produces condensate, and that's the condensate pump, and it pumps outside. It's plugged in. I want to see a, uh, a recent service record. It has a humidifier, which is um, a wet filter that air passes through, and it humidifies the air. So in dry summer, um, dry winter, um, winters in certain climates, um, some people like to have their whole house humidified. There's a damper and a duct, and the control. So it's a heat pump unit. There's no fuel. It's electric, there's an electric wire. It's a big toaster oven essentially for backup. A lot of electricity coming to it. There's an evaporator coil inside. I don't take any of that stuff off. I don't look inside. I'm just looking at the exterior. I'm looking for condensate really problems and making sure that the heating system turns on and the cooling system turns on. I wanna go both cycles. I'm gonna reverse that cycle. Here's, hot, um, here's water supply to the house through a main pipe through a water meter and a shutoff valve. So I identify the location of the shutoff valve for my client. Water meter is not leaking. There's an exterior um, sensor for the water meter. And it looks like some of the, it looks like the, um, it's probably a ice for the refrigerator, a water supply line to the refrigerator. Done. Hot water source. So I'm going through the, the house now at a good clip. There's really not many defects. 
taking pictures, I'm writing my inspection report, I'm talking to my client at the same time, now I'm at the hot water source. So I'm feeling pretty good with my time management and my inspection process and I'm doing well with my client. Electric hot water tank, exterior looks good, 50 gallons, I take a picture of the label. I don't necessarily put it in the report, but I keep it as a reference if anything happens. Um, cold water supplied to the hot water tank, you can shut it off. TPR valve, every hot water tank and system should have a TPR valve, a temperature pressure relief valve. This one's a defect. It shouldn't be installed in this fashion. Why do I know this? Well, because I've gained the knowledge through InterNACHI's online courses. We have a bunch of courses that deal with temperature pressure relief valves and hot water tanks. But also, if you wanted to, you could reference the code. The le uh, most recent code right now is the 2018 International Plumbing Code, and it's section 504.6. It talks about the requirements for discharge piping. Are you a code inspector? Heck no. Oh, that job would stink. You know, the code book is thicker than all these home maintenance books put together. And code inspectors have to know everything in this huge code book. They even have to reference it correctly. As a home inspector, I'm not a code inspector. I'm basically writing up my opinion about things. But my opinion and my observations are based upon what? Code, best practices, building standards, construction practices, things like that. So I need to know what is a defect and not a defect so that when I see something like this, I can correctly call it out as a problem. If we go there, the codes are actually online and public. ICC is a fantastic organization, International Code Council, and they have all of their codes online and open to the public. So you go to the 2018, and it's um, IPC, International Plumbing Code, and it's what? Chapter 5, 504.2, 504, 504, 504, oh, 504, 504, mm, what was it? Safety devices, there we go. Relief valve. Um, and then 504.6, requirements for discharge piping. Um, and there are the things that are required. The discharge piping, servicing a pressure relief valve, temperature relief valve, or combination thereof shall, number one, be directly connected, not be directly connected, to the drainage system. So if you have a discharge coming from a TPR valve into the sewer line, not a good thing. It has to discharge through an air gap located in the same room as the water heater. Really? So the hot water tank has to have a temperature pressure relief valve, and it has to discharge through an air gap, which is a space, right? It's basically a space above any kind of drain or water level. And it has to be in the same room as a hot water source. Wow. Um, let's see, what else? It's really cool. The discharge has to discharge to the floor, to the pan serving the water heater or storage tank, to a waste receptor, or to the outdoors. It has to go in those locations. It can't terminate into um, an air, con uh, air conditioner drainage pan in the attic. It can't drain into um, a standpipe. Of a laundry thing they can't both go in there right has to discharge to the floor to the pan to a waste receptor or to the outdoors has to discharge in a manner that doesn't cause personal in injury or structural damage discharge to a termination point that's readily observable by the building occupants so it can't discharge somewhere where you can't see it right it has to be readily observable it can't be trapped it has to be installed so as to flow by gravity, number nine. It has to be installed so as to flow by gravity. Ah, what's that? Right, so that's not going up is no good. Right, that's how I read the code. That's how I interpret the code. 
If this thing's going up, that's no good. Um, and a couple other things that make this wrong. It's also discharging through the wall. It goes through the wall into another area. So that is a defect. That, I'm sorry. That's a defect. And I really, uh, I like reading the code. I don't know about you. But this is a cool thing to go to the code and learn all the, the 14 things that have to be um, installed, the requirements of this discharge. There are 14 requirements for this discharge. It's how are you going to remember that while looking at the discharge during the inspection? Your mobile device. Put software, your report software here. You can add notes to yourself to make sure that everything is good with that temperature pressure relief discharge pipe. If it helps you reduce making mistakes, if you carry your inspection software with you with a mobile device. So. That's my pitch for doing the mobile. Um, now I'm on the electrical and the structure, right? I did HVAC, hot water, water supply, drainage. Now I do electrical and structure. If I can get through this, I'm doing good with my time. There's the electrical panel. 200 amp, two fingers means 200 amp. Um, no more room, and they're going to half breakers now. And not every breaker is on. I don't know what is going on here, but we have three breakers that are in the off position. Not tripped, but they have been turned off. Do not turn them on. Leave them off. Take a picture of it. Put it in the report. If they're not identified. Ask the seller what is going on. Right? Um, let's see. And that, that 15 amp is not um, identified either. All right. Uh, there's the panel inspection, there's debris on the top, um, there should be GFCI protection there. You're not required to remove the dead front cover. I do. Um, you're not required to. It's not safe. Don't do it. Um, and I'm looking for basically a very thin wire, 14 gauge wire, on a fat breaker, like a 20 amp, 30 amp breaker. That's an overfusing. The size of the breaker are directly related to the size of the wire. You can't have a thin wire on a big fat breaker. So everything's looking good. Um, grounding and neutrals should be under one nut, ideally. And every, every wire should be clamped. I put the dead front cover back on. Now I'm, uh, I'm going to the attic. When I'm in the attic, I'm feeling pretty good because I know that it's about 10 o'clock and I'm going to be in here for just a few minutes. There's only a few things to look at because there's no flooring and it's filled with debris, uh, personal storage. It's in the way. Truss built, blown in insulation, but the thickness is about three and a half inches. The bottom cord of this truss is a two by four. That means three and a half inches tall. And I can see for sure the bottom cords. So it's less than three inches of insulation all around. These people are punching out a ton of energy in the summertime, especially. I bet the second floor is a different climate. It's so hot up there. You can't cool it off. This is why, right? Partially why. So they're wasting a ton of energy. And it looks like they tried to add insulation with some bat insulation installed, and they blocked the solid vents. Doesn't help at all. So I'm looking around, I'm looking around, and I see a bucket to the right. Why is there a bucket? I love when I see buckets in an attic space. And that's leaking. So it must have been a leak from, possibly from the prior roof. Um, if it was leaking um, and they fixed it, I'm not sure. There's nothing actively leaking today. It's not even raining, so I can't comment on it. All I can do is comment on what I see, report upon the evidence, the observations. I see evidence of a prior roof leak. It could be active. It's not raining today. Please ask the seller for information about 
known roof leaks. I mean, they knew that this roof was leaking around this vent stack. We have to ask them about it. Is it an active thing or not, right? Do we need to fix this or is this something in the past? There's a chimney stack. Oh, wait a minute. There's no fuel fired heating system. So this must be a fireplace. The soot on the outside is now a concern. There's soot on the on the top of the chimney fireplace flue and on the outside, um, doesn't look good to me, right? It's not creosote, it's not shiny, but I'm gonna call it out because if it was clean, um, it would be clean. So every fireplace should be inspected and cleaned every year prior to using it. I don't think this one has been cleaned for a while. Man, I can't see anything, but I know that insulation is being compressed by all this storage. It's only three inches thick, this insulation. So I need to tell my client about how much energy that they are wasting because there's a lack of insulation. And when they install insulation, hopefully they'll do some air sealing first. They'll seal some of the air leakage spots and then add insulation. And this is one of the big, biggest, um, uh, one of the easiest things to fix to save energy. Um, the attic pool downstairs is basically just a big open window where a ton of conditioned air that took a lot of energy to create is just escaping through. So at 1015, I'm done with the attic. I'm flying through the uh, interior because what is it? Representative number of windows, doors, receptacles, smoke detectors, railings, steps. If there's a garage, there isn't. I'm in the bathrooms. The bathrooms are pretty easy. It's basically the same thing over and over again. Flush the toilet, wiggle it with your legs, see if it moves. Hot and cold water to the sink, open up the cabinets, touch the trap, the valves, uh, hit the GFCI. Is there a light? Is there a fan? Um, shower, the tub, hot and cold water, the drain, the interior surfaces, maybe piling on some tiles, looking for any kind of damage, water damage. Shower, hot and cold water, Everything's running it all at the same time. Turn it all off, shut it all off, out. It's fantastic. Oh, but there is a garage. Garage door opener. Have to have safety devices, laser and reverse. There's 10 steps to inspecting your garage door. Garage door is really important to inspect. It's the largest moving object in the house. So it should have the safety devices. Um, that are required nowadays. And I like that shot because it allows me to tell the judge that I can't see everything, Your Honor. You know, it was filled with, there was a hole on the right side. Yeah, there was termite damage. Yeah, I believe that. I couldn't see it during the inspection. I can't see through personal items. I don't move debris and personal items to see everything. Uh, that's not what a home inspection is. Um, that's beyond the scope of a home inspection. And I can prove what was there and what was not there. So I'm sometimes taking pictures just around because they're free. Click, 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 click. And if you are using a particular software, you can take pictures that won't appear in your report, but you're snapping away to take pictures to save them in your archive gallery. Okay, so... The discharge for the condensate goes into the sewer line. <laughs> it doesn't go outside. <laughs> Why they don't just follow the refrigerant line and go outside? Discharge that condensate outside. You can follow the refrigerant lines. Just attach it to it if you wanted to and go outside. They decided to pump all that condensate water into a hole in, into the main sewer line, right? There's, that, that's so wrong. That's a big bowl of wrong. So um, on many fronts. So that's in my report. <clears throat> we need a plumber to come in and, and read and do something with that. That's just silly. So uh, and there's the cleanup. And there's the refrigerant line. They could have just followed it there, but they didn't. Um, the door itself um, is not fire rated. So there is some code that you use. You use code as a foundation upon which to build a really good um, knowledge base of 
about how to perform in a, a home inspection. You're not doing a code inspection, you'll even reference code, but you'll reference it mentally, right? Because you need to identify things like this, like this is not a fire rated door. Um, so I'm gonna flag this. We need to replace that door so that everyone is safe. Um, there's the fireplace. There it is, pre-factory. You're required to open and, open and close the damper door on the fireplace according to the standards of practice. I take a picture of the flu. I'm not required to inspect the flu, but I'm gonna take a picture of it. Here's the problem. I don't know what that is. And I'm not required to know what it is, but it looks like bathroom silicone. <laughs> it's white silicone that they filled the cracks with. I don't know what is going on. Um, the panels can be replaced. They're expensive. Uh, it's fairly easy to replace them. When they crack, there's sometimes a wire mesh inside that's exposed. You don't want heat passing through the fire brick, the, the fire rated uh, panel, heat resistant uh, panel that looks like brick, but it's fake. It's just those panel walls in the prefactory, but they're about an inch thick. They need they need to be replaced. They can't be siliconed uh, and patched. That's just a fire hazard. So this is a lot of fun. I'm having a lot of fun with this home inspection. Um, I have two windows here um, that have fogged window panes, lost seals. Uh, I want to show that I'm looking around as much as I can on the basement floor especially. Um, basement floors are kind of cool. Um, and any smoke detector that's yellow should be replaced. So I have this. They still make this, Hydro Shark. Uh, remember that inspectorcoach.com, inspectorcoach.com. Um, she has a link to this Hydro Shark. It's kind of cool. It's an extendable moisture meter with probes, right? And I, as a home inspector, I don't care what the actual humidity level is. I'm not measuring anything. What I do is um, it gives me an audio video, an audio and visual indicator of moisture. So there's no moisture in my weather. It's a good thing. But this is what I would do during my home inspections. I just go around and I check, right? It's really cool. I like this tool a lot. And I'll put those um, pictures in the report, if I can remember. There's a defect here. There's no handrail for the steps. So you need a graspable handrail on all steps. Um, for me, it's all steps. Um, code, I think now it's, it's like four or six steps until our handrail is required. Forget that, you know, there's no way. So if some if a code inspector goes, well, that's that's within code. It's it's also a grandfather. I don't pay attention to that either. Remember, I'm not a code inspector. I can just say whatever I think is uh, safe for my client. If if it's inf valuable information that my client ought to know, I'm going to tell it to my client. And my client ought to know that people need a graspable handrail for this. This flight of steps one. I'm counting one, two, three, four, five. That's how I count those steps. That's five steps. A handrail is needed. And I inspect every home regardless of the date it was manufactured, <laughs> built. I don't care how old it is. It could be brand new. It could be 50 years old. No one's going to tell me, well, that's grandfathered. That defect, and that's how I say it. That, so you're saying that defect there is grandfathered? That makes the defect go away. No, it's still a safety hazard. When that home was built, I guess the code inspector said, well, that's okay. Nowadays, that's a defect. That's a safety hazard for an older person or a person with, you know, uh, a need for assistance getting up five steps. So you need a graspable handrail. I don't care when the house is built. Don't use the word grandfathered. That's a defect. Wow. I like being a home inspector. Thank goodness I'm not a code inspector. Uh, I like the water catch pan underneath the clothes washer. That's cool. Braided mesh, pressure tested hoses. Those are nice. Dryer uh, plug. That's nice. Um, the receptacles in the laundry room need to be GFCI protected. So that one over there need to be needs to be GFCI protected. Um, bathrooms, toilet flush. There's a trap. GFCI. 
shower, tub, drain, fan, light, plumbing access panel. It's painted and I can't remove it. So I want to tell my client that I can't see what's beyond there. Second bathroom, GFCI, I get in there. With these um, showers, they're plastic. Um, sometimes uh, they're fiberglass and they're crunchy because they weren't supported underneath. So there's a separation when you stand inside a fiberglass shower. There's a separation around the drain because the drain pipe doesn't move, but the fiberglass kind of sags and it's not supported. You know, crack, it would be like crunchy, you know. And plastic too, plastic can sag as well if it's not supported. Sometimes they'll just foam it up. Ideally, there would be concrete or mortar underneath and be embedded in something that's not going to give. So it's a, a firm floor. Sometimes I'll pound on tiles um, to make sure the tiles are in good shape. And frankly, I try to get a shower door to leak. If it can leak, it shouldn't. If I can direct that water towards the shower, it shouldn't leak. And if it leaks, I'm not paying for it. If the dishwasher leaks because I turned it on and it leaks on the floor, I should be congratulated for finding a defect. If the garage door falls off its rails, um, I should be congratulated for finding the defect, right? If, if something breaks in my hand, if the sink trap, if I grab the sink trap, because that's what I do, or I touch the valve in it, falls apart in my hand, the first thing I do is take a picture of it and put in the report and I tell the listing agent that that is broken. You may want to put a flag on that. Don't let anybody use the sink, right? Don't let anybody turn the dishwasher back on because it leaks on the floor. I'll wipe it up, but it's a defect that I found. I don't, you know, I, I once went to a chapter meeting and the, the person said um, that he bought a dishwasher because it leaked. That's your job to find the leak at the dishwasher. You turn it on, it leaks, that's a defect, right? So um, there are a few tips on what happens when you break things. Don't worry about it. You're, that's your job, to find things that will break for your client before it breaks on them. So uh, as you can see, I don't park my truck in the driveway. I park it in the street. I allow my clients and list, listing agent and seller's agent to um, have access to the driveway. That's the third lost seal. That's the third fogged window pane in this house. Here's number four. I'm using my fingers. Uh, receptacles, fans, interior looks pretty good. There's the fifth one, five fogged window panes. First floor, um, that sink is leaking. So it's not dripping right now into a, a bucket but there's white silicone gooped all over the trap between the sink and the tailpiece. The piece goes in there, right? So um, that should be fixed. It's just a gasket. Gasket needs to be replaced. That's a 20 minute job by a homeowner, but I'm gonna call it a plumber problem. I'm gonna call it a major defect because most homeowners have no skills to maintain their home. So a plumber can be um, called. And uh, the interior? Rest of it is looking good. I'm getting to the kitchen and I feel really good because I'm way ahead of schedule. It's about 10.30 and I'm in the kitchen and this is where I'm gonna end my inspection report and get paid. Hot and cold water at the sink, garbage disposal, um, supply, uh, valves, GFCI protection, and all kitchen counter receptacles and kitchen receptacles, dishwasher, running short sink, uh, short cycle, Range, oven, don't let go of the oven. If it's on, you got to remember to turn that oven off. Um, and that's from personal experience. So one of the rules we had was if you turn the oven on, you got to hold on to the oven door handle and not move. You're not allowed to move. And so you test it and do whatever you need to do to finish that inspection. You turn it off and you let go of the door handle. Right? So um, all fans, including, including bathroom fans and kitchen fans and dryer exhaust, should go outside. But this one is just recycling inside. I'm going to do a summary with my client. I'm going to go over the inspection report, right? Like before, I showed you this binder that I give. Um, if my client wants to wait a few more minutes, 
I'll say, oh, I'll print out the report right now if you like, including, including the summary. Um, it'll all be online as well. Now it's cloud-based stuff, right? And at 11.01, strike the credit card and I make my money. Um, if you need help in finding a, a nice deal on a credit card machine, go to natchit.org slash merchant. Now let's see, can I bring up the, can I bring up the, hold on a second. So here's the inspection report. Um, and this is the, that's why, how do I get, yeah, something like that. So here's the roof section, and uh, I break it down into systems and components. So here's the roof section and the uh, type of material. So I take a bunch of pictures, and then the estimated age, because that's what my client always wants. Uh, how old is this uh, roof? Well, I try to tell them. And then the number of layers, there's two layers, and the flashing, and the ventilation, and the gutters and downspouts. Remember that disconnected downspout. And there's a chimney. Um, the flashing is okay. Um, there's the damper in the fireplace. And then there's the exterior. And it just goes on and on like that with pictures, lots of pictures, and lots of words, and lots of pictures. I don't type everything. When you use software, you basically check mark with your finger, check, check sentences that you want to say. And if you want to say something that you haven't said before, because you've said it before, it'll be written down in the report template. So you can just mark it in the next one. Then I don't like typing, so I just click the microphone and I say the sentences that I want to say. If it's a customized narrative, we call them narratives, comment that you want to put in the report. So using this is really, going mobile is really a, a high recommendation from me. I really like that. There's so many advantages. So when you're choosing a report software, make sure it has a mobile um, uh, option. So there's the heating system, evaporator coil, uh, hasn't been serviced and cleaned, um, water, hot water tank, um, electrical, um, electrical panel, electrical meter. Um, there's the structure in the basement. There's the attic. Um, there's a bucket in the attic. Um, there's no insulation for the drop um, pull down stairs. There's the bathrooms, um, laundry, kitchen, interior, the, all the windows that have a problem. And then there's a little uh, report conclusion and walkthrough. They should hire me to walk through the house one more time. And there's that letter for the seller. So it's a 40-page uh, a report that I produce for my client. And I produced it for them at the inspection, or it just goes to the cloud and I send them a link um, so that they can read it later. And that is the uh, inspection. And I have uh, about 50 questions. <laughs> I'm not sure if we're going to get to them all, but um, let's see if, if we uh, want to answer some questions here. Um, let's see. So there's a question, Mark asked a question about um, levels of uh, insurance. So if you wanted to go back again and do the insurance question, um, it is at natchi.org slash insurance and get a quote on insurance for home inspectors with a special um, consideration for InterNACHI members. Uh, how would you word your report when you find mold in a crawl space? Um, I turn around to my client and I ask them, uh, this looks like mold, right? Uh, EPA says if it looks like mold, it's probably mold. But um, my opinion may not go well with the seller. We could take a sample for 50 bucks and uh, get the lab results in a few days to confirm that it's mold, right? And the EPA also says that um, you can clean it up if it's less than 10 square feet. Anything greater than 10 square feet, 
um, you need professional help to clean that up. Um, so if it's a little bit of mold and it looks like mold, I'll tell my client it's probably mold, clean it up yourself. If it's looking like mold, I'll tell my client it's probably mold, you don't need to sample it, but I could. And if it's greater than 10 square feet, the report is going to have the swab sample um, and a report and a recommendation for a professional to come in and clean up the mold. Now in a crawl space, or anywhere where there's mold, you don't have to as a home inspector, but you could have fun in trying to diagnose what the problem is. And that's what I really enjoyed. When you're beginning, you're just trying to document what you see, right, and get paid. When, you're, when you do it for five years, 10 years, you have fun in diagnosing and see if you can diagnose a problem for your client um, without wasting a lot of time. Because you're, you know, you're, you have to manage your time. So, but have fun. Um, so, um, I would try to find it. I try to find the source of the problem, which is the moisture intrusion, and that's always fun. It's coming from the outside somehow, or it could be an interior water leak or a drip of some kind, right? So that's kind of neat. Or it could be um, a water vapor or a high humidity level issue or a lack of ventilation or. Something. So that's kind of fun. So in a crawl space, uh, there's a lot of things going on. So um, it's neat how nowadays building science has grown and, and matured. And we're to a point where we treat a crawl space like in a really short basement room. It should be a finished room. Think of a crawl space as a finished room of a basement. Now, if you're in a climate in a geographical area where there are no basements, then I'm, you know, don't worry about it. But wherever you're, wherever you are, if you know what a basement is or a crawl space, it should look like an unfinished basement room. There's a vapor barrier and a concrete floor, maybe some drainage. The walls are smooth and clean and structurally sound and insulated. The the abandoned room joist. Is sealed and insulated. The floor doesn't have to be insulated um, because if it's a conditioned air room, then the crawl space is part of the house, right? Or you can separate it, but it should be treated like a short basement room. And a crawl space, if it's treated like a short basement room, right, wouldn't have an open vent. So we're moving away from having these crawl spaces with outside air moving in and out of that crawl space. Right? We're trying to block all that and actually condition the room and treat it like part of the house. If you can condition the air, that's really nice. If you can't, then it has to be separated, but it's still, it's not sharing air from the outside. That's where building science has progressed with crawl spaces. And Internet, she has a really great article on it. It's, um, I don't know if I can find it for you, but I can tell you where the articles are. Achi.org slash articles. And so you go to the articles library. It's a library of articles. And in there we have um, about crawl spaces. Uh, how to inspect and correct a vented crawl space. Bam. So um, we have articles about how to treat a vented crawl space. Um, you treat it like a basement room. Close off the vents, and you insulate the walls. Um, what software are you using, uh, Spectora? So these are older questions from. Uh, if you are a brand new inspector like me, with no construction background to boast about, what do you do when realtors ask you how much experience you have? My method so far has been to talk up my training and certifications and references. Yep. Um, also, don't you try to make lemons of the lemonade. You ch don't try to hide either. I mean, I may, if I was new, I may consider just coming out and saying, yep, I'm relatively new. And here's why that's an advantage to you and your client, because I don't have another job today. This is my only job. I do one a day. And I'll spend all the time you want with your client. Um, so I'm not in rush 
like the next inspector who has to do two or three because they have a big multi-inspector corporation and they're doing a lot of jobs. Blah, blah, blah. I like to take care of my clients nice and slow, and that's how I'm going to, you know, something like that. I have been trained and certified. I have over 500 hours of training under my belt. I've done inspections. I've done many inspections. Uh, I have sample reports of all of my inspections on my website. If you take a look, to take a look at my credentials and my reports, um, here's a sample of my report here. Um, and also, just to relieve any risk of referring work to you, uh, referring your clients to me, <laughs> if you're talking to a real estate agent, is um, I have a buyback guarantee where if I miss actually miss something uh, as part of my inspection, that uh, International will buy the home back. And that's under um, natchi.org. And that's, that's uh, natchi.org slash buy. Okay? Um, and that's a really great way to get in. Um, also, like infrared. I don't know if you were here for the infrared. Um, uh, is it Mark? Uh, I missed the name. Sorry, um, infrared is a neat way to show maybe more credibility and qualifications when you're just new. So you try to pile on a lot of value to compensate for your um, lack of veteran experience, right? So you have to compete with the veterans who have been doing inspections for a long time with other things. Um, use a buyback book. One of the neat things is if you go to, uh, if I may recommend, um, Inspector Coach, I kind of like this service um, because I know her. Um, Inspector Coach, if you go here and go to Downloads, the middle one says Tips for Marketing to Real Estate Agents and Home Buyers. In there, you get a ton of really good advice about how to market to real estate agents. One of the things that we found is that um, this flyer, this um, uh, the flyer that I had for my my home inspection company. So let's pretend that this is a flyer, and it's Big Ben Inspections flyer that I give to my clients who are buying a home. It talks about how to perform a home inspection, and qualifications, and training, and what do you get with it with by hiring me, the home maintenance book, and all that stuff. This flyer for my home buying clients makes no sense to a real estate agent, right? They could care less. You need to contact InterNACHI's member marketing team to design a customized flyer that speaks to real estate agents, right? And one of the things that real estate agents love is, can you um, provide me what I need? But one of the things that they want is um, a home inspection that's kind of backed up by something. So that if you make a mistake, there's a way for the agent to save face. And the best way to do that is really InterNACHI's buyback program. I, mean, I can't, I haven't come up with any other alternative that reduces, almost eliminates all risk of a real estate agent referring work to you. Regardless of how many years you've been in business, that buyback is something else. It really is good. Um, don't go for the warranties, the home warranties, and all that other stuff. The Google home warranty, see what pops up. No one really likes it. But the buyback is amazing and it works. And everybody wins. Your client who wants to get out, they win. Home was bought back from. You win because you may have missed something or not. And you have a, um, a mechanism to resolve this issue. And the real estate agent likes it because they can sell the house again. Right? And um, the other agent likes it because we're going to have to list it and sell it again. So there are two agents that like that resolution. Your client likes it, and you're looking good. Hmm. That's a tip within the in that document from Inspector Coach. Tips for marketing to real estate agents and home buyers. You need a flyer designed to, that speaks to people buying a home, selling a home. That's a completely different message. And there's a huge different message, completely different message, message 
of a flyer that speaks directly to real estate agents. Uh, don't, one of the worst things you could do is go to a presentation of a real estate office and hand out a flyer that's designed for home buyers. Why would you hand out a flyer designed for home buyers to real estate agents, right? You have to give them something that they want. Real estate agents want to know, can I refer my clients to you? You have to get that message. You can get that brand on a piece of marketing. And if you don't know how to do it, there's a document that helps you and then contact InterNACHI's member marketing team for consultation about developing your brand and your customized uh, marketing materials. Print marketing is really important, but it's gotta have this, the right message. Um, let's bring this up. If you go to Inspector Coach, um, there's a free webinar also coming up. Uh, let's go backwards. I'm gonna go backwards and work my way back. Um, what are you buying back? You're buying the home back. Internet actually buys the home back. The home that you inspected, that your client bought and moved in and found a problem that you should have seen, that they, they claim you missed, within the 90 days, they can have Internet actually buy the home back and they can find another home. Bye-bye. It's the home. Um, What's the strangest creature you've seen in a crawl space? Uh, I once came up on a mirror and I saw myself. Wouldn't that promote mold growth? Um, four point, Ruben. Hi, my name is Ruben. Is a four point mitigation good as a free service to your inspection? Is a four point mitigation good at, to add as a free service? Oh, no. Oh gosh, to do a four point. I guess you're talking in Florida. Man, that's a separate, that's a, um, they don't charge very much, but you can do 10 in a day. So 50 bucks per, in and out, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, you can do a ton a day. So um, I wouldn't, I don't know, I wouldn't, I would charge it separately. I'd do a home inspection and tack it on. One of the ways you can market to home buyers is packaging services. Instead of, Listing everything individually, it's very complicated. Why don't you just do a gold package where you have a mold, uh, sorry, a home inspection, a four point, and a wind mitigation for 650, or whatever the amount is. I don't care. Whatever the amount is, make the package amount, dollar amount, smaller in cost than it would be if you purchased each service individually. And added it up, right? So get a discount on the package. I don't know why that works. It just works with consumers. So instead of buying things a la carte individually and paying a lot of money because I'm buying them individually, package it for me, right? Gold package, bronze package, silver package. What do you charge for a final walkthrough? Um, 100 bucks because I'm in and out in about a half an hour to an hour. And my, I like the rate of $100 an hour. That's pretty cool. $100, $200 an hour is really good. So, um, but that's me personally as a home inspector. You could charge nothing to whatever, right? It's really up to you. Oh, and how do you know what to charge for uh, an inspection? This is so good. How do you calculate an inspection fee that's profitable? It's not a secret. This is there's there are no secrets to being a successful home inspector, right? I mean, there's a lot of things out there that are being sold like secrets or something. There are no secrets, right? Um, Internet actually reveals all the secrets to be successful, and we provide the, all the resources and everything you need to be successful, right? Some of you need coaches or mentors or a colleague and a peer or something to help you along. Make sure you do your homework, get this done. Did you do this yet? Okay, come on and do that. Let me look at that. Let me review your website. Let me look at your inspection report. Okay, you need to improve, like, you know, so you may need some hand-holding, and that's fantastic, right? As long as you do it, do it one way or another, right? Um, 
So how do you calculate a, a profitable inspection fee? Well, you go to natchez.org slash education. Mm, get to our education page. You type in where it says search courses, type in business. And right here, home inspection business course pops up. It's free and online. Click the green button. And you go to chapter 11, calculating pricing and billing. It's all about math. What should you charge has very little to do with what other inspectors are charging because they may be starting. You don't want to do that. What do you charge? Well, it's math. There's a mathematical formula in chapter 11 of the Home Inspection Business Course. That's what you should do. You don't have to do a whole business course. Do chapter 11 only. In and out. It's okay. It's free and online. Come back anytime you want. And figure it out. It goes through an exercise. It's a mathematical formula you can do. Adding and dividing. That's all you do. Um, and I liked it, personally liked it, because when I answered my business phone, I knew that it was a profitable sales call. I didn't have to sell somebody and guess what I should charge for my services, right? I put my, um, my fees, my services and my fees on my website and on my flyers so everybody knew. I charged $396. That's my base price, right? And uh, I had my ancillary services and I had my packages. That's how, I, that's how I did it. So when the phone rang, I answered my own phone. I knew that this was a profitable inspection because I've done all the hard work. I figured out what the price is, and when I sold that inspection fee on the phone, I had I had assurance that I was going to make a profitable. I, I was going to make a lot of money. Right, a lot of people are guessing out there, like. Someone asked, what should I charge for a windmill in Florida? Uh, I, I don't know. What did the math tell you? Did you do the math? Or are you looking at other inspectors going, well, I guess, I guess we're all doing it for this certain price. Florida is terrible. Florida, they're all pushing the prices down, 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 down. Right? And as you learned in the beginning of this class, way to demand higher fees, there is a way, right? Developing your brand, you know, we use that a lot, but developing value, offering value so you can charge more. Right? Um, and a little thing about answering the phone, answer the phone. I got started off and we answered the phone. When the phone rang, if it was during an inspection, we answered it. You gotta answer your phone. You can do it in a way that is, um, Respectful to your existing client if you're with your client and the phone rings Right, you've done the math already. So you know that this is profit. All you got to do is close it Close the sale So you answer the phone and you say to your client Your client that you're doing a home inspection for this is one of my clients um, May I take this phone call? They may have a question for me that I can answer in just a few seconds and I'll come right back to you and Your client right? Who's watching you answer the phone? They're, you give they're, they'll give you permission to answer. That's it's going to be a knee jerk reaction. Sure, go ahead and answer the phone. And then while you're talking, they're going to think to themselves, "This inspector has clients, right? He she takes care of the clients, right? I want to be part of that group, right? That if I have a question, I can call my home inspector, and they'll answer the phone." No matter what, that's quality customer service right there. Access to information by the expert, right? You. So when you answer the phone, don't freak out, right? You're 95% there from closing the transaction. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of hesitation and concern about how to answer the phone and closing the deal. You're basically 95% there. There's there are companies out there that answer the phone for you, and they they um, 
they're very proud of their closing rate being over 90%. No, 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 no wonder. I mean, when someone calls you to schedule an inspection, they're already at the point of, uh, of closing the deal with you. All, they, all you got to do is say hello. They're ready to hire you anyways. The closing rate on a phone call that comes to a home inspector on the phone line is, is already 90%. 95%, I would say, you're going to close this deal, right? All you got to say is, yeah, I'll be there. That's about it. Answer the phone. And you don't have to hire a call center that claims to have really high closing rates. Of course, anyone who picks up the phone, my 14-year-old daughter has a 95% has a closing rate if she answers the phone for me, right? Just All she has to do is say, yeah, we'll be there. Okay. What's your phone number? And I'll call you back to confirm. Bye. That's all, that's all you got to do. So don't, you know, don't be impressed by other people answering your phone. You're already there. Um, you'll close that deal because you're, that person calling you has found their dream home. And, oh, before that, has looked at a ton of homes worked with a real estate agent, found a real estate agent, found a, a loan officer, found, has been pre-approved, has found a dream home, has found the right school system, found the right neighborhood, has gotten a pre-approved for the loan, has looked at the home already once or twice, has signed an agreement, and now they're calling you because they know that every real estate transaction should have a home inspection. It's not like they're calling and asking you, should I have a home inspection? What is a home inspection? We're past that. They're all, all they want to do is call and say, I need a home inspection on Monday. Are you available? And you say, yes. I'll call you later to confirm. I'm on the roof right now. Would that be okay? I'll call you in about an hour. Okay, bye. You closed the deal already. Yeah. You're 95% there. Don't worry about answering the phone. Just answer it. Say, yes, you'll be there. I hope that helps. Uh... Can you tell that door is garage and not fire? Yeah, um, there's a piece of metal attached with roofing nails attached to the uh, garage side of the door. That's not a fire rated door. Um, do you fill all the sinks and tubs with water and let them release at one time to make sure this is proper? Sure. Um, there are many ways to determine functional flow and functional drainage. Um, I just turn everything on, hot and cold, all at the same time, and see if it's functional based upon my experience. That's it. I don't measure, although I guess in certain states, they actually require you to measure the, the flow and the pressure using a pressure gauge, but we don't do that. These are good questions. Um, do you provide a link to code in your report? Manual, no. No, because I'm a home inspector. I keep that stuff to myself. If I need to argue with someone, like a contractor that says, well, you know, um, I'll maybe reference, I, I got this, you know, the discharge pipe has 14 requirements. Here they are in section 504.6, right? But I won't put any code reference in the inspection report. I don't want my client to think that I have something to do with code. Um, I want to live within the comfort zone of a home inspector's work scope and the standards of practice. That's all I do. I'm a generalist. I give my opinion, and I'm not an expert in anything. Don't ever call yourself an expert. And don't ever say anything about code. Um, so there are a few things that you have to kind of set up with some legal advice. And Internet actually has a legal department. You can get this legal advice, and there's a lot of it online as well, about not calling yourself an expert, not um, calling yourself a, a code inspector, not referencing code in your inspection report, things like that that will help protect you, help reduce your liability. All right, that is a little over two hours. Um, please feel free to email me your questions. We can keep going if you'd like. Um, I'm on the contact page, and um, that was a lot of fun. We talked about a lot of things. Did a home inspection. We talked about business and writing reports and marketing and branding and phone calls and all that good stuff. And I answered some of your questions. 
Uh, if I didn't answer all of them, I apologize, but I'm on the contact page. Just email me. I'll get to it. And again, I want to pitch one more service, uh, Inspector Coach. Um, don't spend any money. Just do the free download. Download the eight steps to building a home inspection business. It's really good. You can do them yourself if you wanted to. But uh, successful people um, have coaches or mentors or peers to help them be successful. And you may want to consider hiring a coach. All right, everybody. I will leave it at that. And I thank you so much. My name is Ben Gramico from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And uh, I'll see you in the next class. Bye, everybody.